Welcome to the next episode of the All Together Show. I'm your host, Eric Satz, and with me today is Bill Spitz. Bill, welcome to the show. Well, I'm delighted to be here. You're very kind to ask me to join you. No, oh, I'm, I'm super excited to have you here. You know, like this, this is one of the few episodes, and I have to remember that it's, it's mostly audio, but we will get some video views where I want to say like, you know, hey, I'm Joe Buck, and this is Hall of Famer Troy Aikman, except I'm saying, hey, I'm Eric Satz, and this is Hall of Famer Bill Spitz. I mean, you you received the Foundation and Endowment Money Management Lifetime Achievement Award. You're the co-founder and principal at Diversified Trust. You're on the board of Mass Mutual. You're also the lead director at Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance. And you're the vice chancellor for investments at Vanderbilt, now emeritus, but previously vice chancellor for uh, a significant period of time. I'm super excited to have you. This is an interesting, you know, sort of high level biography of who Bill Spitz is. But if I ask you who you are in your own words, what's what's the answer? Well, I tell you, when I was in my 20s, I saw a cartoon about a Renaissance man. And I thought, that's interesting. What's a Renaissance man? So I did a little research on that. And I decided, you know, that's what I want to be. And the definition of a Renaissance man is someone who's interested in everything. And of course, I'll never get there. But but it's been an objective of mine for a long time to try to do a lot of different things and to go a lot of places and to have many interests. So you know, in addition to my career, you know, I've tried to have lots of hobbies. I've tried to travel. You know, I've tried to read a lot. And, uh, you know, I'm interested in art and music and all kinds of things. So, uh, you know, th that's that's who I am, is trying to be all of those things. And, you know, maybe it's a mile wide and an inch deep, but that's fine. That's what I want to do. No, nah, I love that answer. So let's go back to the beginning. Where and when were you born? I was born in Pensacola, Florida in 1951. My father uh, was a chemical engineer, was with a uh, chemical company there in the Panhandle of Florida. And we lived there until I was in the eighth grade. My dad got a promotion to corporate headquarters, which was in New York. So we moved to the New York suburbs and uh, I lived there for one year. And then I went off to boarding school uh, for three years and then to college. And, and you know, then my career started. I, I got an MBA at the University of Chicago and spent 10 years on Wall Street in New York. And, you know, I, I didn't love it. And uh, I was an alumnus of Vanderbilt and Vanderbilt approached me about coming back to Nashville to manage the endowment. And I thought, oh, you know, don't be silly. I'm a Wall Street guy. And then the more I thought about it, uh, two things. One, it would be a better quality of life for my family. But second, it was probably a better use of my time because I had been a portfolio manager and an analyst. And I really didn't think I was very good at it. Uh, I didn't particularly love it. Uh, but I thought, you know, I'm a decent overall investment thinker. And it turns out that being at Vanderbilt and running the endowment there, which was managed entirely by outside firms, was a much, much better use of my skills. So, you know, we had roughly 150 different organizations that managed a piece of the endowment fund spread all over the world. So what I did was figure out, you know, how to allocate the money and then who to pick to manage it. And that turned out to be a better fit for me. And it was a really rewarding career. Well, wow, there's a lot to unpack in that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what we can do here. Uh, where was boarding school? I went to Phillips Academy at Andover, one of the yep. famous boarding schools in this country. And I was certainly one of the dumber people there. And a number of my classmates have gone on to be hugely successful people of all kinds. But uh, it was a great experience. And I can't say that I enjoyed it particularly. It was all male. It was sort of a Spartan existence. But I got a great education. So, you know, I've always been grateful for that. So so how do you go from, you know, Andover in the Northeast, all boys school environment, back down south to to Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee? What what drove that? Well, I tell you, a lot of the big decisions I've made in my life, I didn't make very carefully and with a lot of thought. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had applied to a number of schools, and I got into some, didn't get into some. And it was coming down to the point where I had to make a decision. And I met a really good-looking girl who was going to Vanderbilt. And I thought, oh, okay, fine, I'll do that. So that's that's what drove me to Vanderbilt, actually. Well, there are worse things, I guess. 
Right, exactly. It turned out to be a pretty good choice for you, I think. So um, I, we, we will, of course, get to your time at, at Vanderbilt, but was there, was there space between Vanderbilt and U Chicago, or did you go right from undergrad to graduate school? You know, back in those days, you could go directly from undergrad to graduate school. So I graduated from Vanderbilt in May, and I started University of Chicago in June. And I actually finished a two-year MBA program in a year and a half. And I have to tell you, you know, that was sort of the highlight of my career. You know, I enjoyed my career, but the intellectual stimulation of being at a place like University of Chicago with the people that were in my class is just dynamite. And, you know, I had uh, some unbelievable professors, including some well-known ones like Arthur Laffer and uh, Myron Scholes, uh, you know, Bob Alibur, people who were really well-known professors. So I was right there in the intellectual, you know, center of the financial world. Yeah. So it, it's funny you said that because I, I was going to go there because earlier you said you were, I don't know, one of the dumber people at Andover, which I find hard to believe, by the way. And and I think the the proof is in the pudding in the sense that you end up at University of Chicago, which is a pretty heady school. Uh, oh, yeah. And you ju- you 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 just reeled off a number of very well known uh, professors and and intellectuals, not to mention comedians. If anyone knows Arthur Laffer out there, uh, and and has been in the same room with him for any period of time, but um, yeah, I mean. No flies on University of Chicago. That, that what what was it like to be there in those days? Well, it was fantastic. Uh, actually, Fisher Black and Myron Scholes were there, and they were developing the Black Scholes option model. That was real time while I was there. Uh, there's a fellow named Dan Galai who real pro- time wasn't even a phrase yet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> I had another professor there named Dan Galai, who's a professor now emeritus uh, at Hebrew University in uh, Jerusalem. But he was the guy that developed the VIX index originally. And so, you know, I was right there in the middle of really exciting stuff. It it was so stimulating. And of course, my classmates have gone on to be very, very successful people in the financial world and uh, and in other venues as well. So so where do you, how do you, get to Wall Street, where do you end up before you realize, you know, that Wall Street really isn't your gig? Well, so it was another of those decisions I made without a great deal of forethought. Another girl. (laughs) It wasn't a girl this time, but I had a good buddy that uh, was at Vanderbilt with me. He was two years older, went to the University of Chicago, uh, two years ahead of me, and then decided to become a portfolio manager. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. I don't know what else I want to do. So uh, I decided to go down that career path, and I started my career at, at what is now Citigroup. It was back then Citibank in the yep. investment management uh, department. Uh, I spent a few years there both as an analyst and a portfolio manager, and then I worked for a couple of other investment firms. And, you know, I was never really happy, and I thought maybe it was the uh, the firms weren't great. It turns out that the firms were all perfectly good. What was wrong was that I just wasn't particularly happy doing that kind of work. I just, I wasn't passionate about picking stocks. Uh, you know, I didn't care what IBM's earnings were next quarter. I mean, I just, I just couldn't get into that. But I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what's going on in the world and, you know, are there new and interesting asset classes out there? And, and so that's how I got to Vanderbilt and why that was a good fit. So was there a, uh, a professor or multiple professors at Chicago uh, or was there somebody on Wall Street sort of as you transition from Wall Street to Vanderbilt? W- was there a single greatest influence on you? Yeah, there actually was. There's a fellow named Hunter Lewis, who is one of the two founders of Cambridge Associates, which is a consulting firm that works with most of the large endowments in the United States. It's also now an OCIO firm that man- actually manages a large number of endowments. But uh, Hunter was a tremendous influence on me in two ways. One, you know, he and his firm really guided sort of my investment thinking and how I managed the, the Vanderbilt Endowment. But second, if you if you read about Hunter, he's a really interesting guy. He, he is the Renaissance man. He wrote a book about values. He wrote a book about capitalism. I mean, he's really a, a broad thinker. And uh, so I always admire someone who can you know, have a lot of technical skill in one area, but be a broad thinker as well. 
So what, what, what year is it when you make the move back south and, and, and move back to Vanderbilt to begin to manage the endowment? 1985. And uh, the interesting thing about that is almost at exactly the same time I moved to Vanderbilt, Dave Swenson left uh, Wall Street and went to Yale. And uh, so uh, back in those days, the, uh, the CIOs of the, uh, the major universities were all uh, very close and collegial, and we used to share ideas, et cetera. Not so much the case anymore because everybody's competing each with each other because incentive comp programs are based on how you perform versus other endowments. But back in those days, uh, we were all quite collegial. So I used to talk to you know my counterparts at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Duke, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so there was, a, there was a crop of us that were kind of all in the same era uh, including David, myself, a guy named Scott Malpass, who ran the Notre Dame endowment very successfully over time. So that that's really interesting. And I, like this is like taking candy from a baby. By the way, you lead right to my next uh, right to my next question, which was going to be what was the relationship with David Swenson at Yale? Because um, so often when people talk about alternative assets, they talk about Yale's endowment portfolio um, and incorporating at, at given points in time up to 80% of alternative assets in that portfolio. What was the evolution and discussion between you in terms of um, how to incorporate these additional asset classes into a portfolio? Well, you know, uh, and I don't want to, David died a, a couple of years ago, so I don't want to, uh, you know, say anything unkind. But, you know, David gets credit for having created the endowment model, what's called the endowment model, which is heavily dependent on equities generally and non-traditional assets in particular. David didn't really create that. Cambridge Associates created, created that sort of thing. Now, David was probably the best practitioner of, of it, but he really didn't create the idea. So Vanderbilt had it started investing in uh, venture capital in the late 70s. We'd started investing in international equities in 1980. And so, and, and Duke and Stanford and Harvard and, you know, many other places were in the same position. So, you know, Yale, as I said, Yale probably did it better than anybody else, but a lot of other institutions were doing the same thing uh, that David was doing. But, you know, we all talked and, uh, you know, David would call me up and say, hey, you know, we found this really interesting fund. You ought to take a look at it. And I would do the same for him and so on. And uh, there's a fellow running the uh, Harvard endowment then named Jack Meyer. Jack left and started a very successful hedge fund, uh, which we invested with, and he eventually shut it down. But, you know, there was good relationships between all of these people. And it was, you know, these people were very smart. And Cambridge Associates used to host a uh, meeting once a year for a couple of days uh, for the CIOs of the 30 or 40 largest endowments. So we would all sit in a room and share ideas and talk. And uh, it, it was just really stimulating. Do you know what the growth in the endowment was during your tenure? Sure. When I got there, it was 301 million. When <laughs> I left, it was 3.5 billion. And in the meantime, they net took out $600 million. So that's the net of new gifts and the spending that went out of the endowment into the operating budget every year. Yeah. So the investment return was three hundred million to four billion one over twenty yeah. over twenty two years. May, and it may everybody do that, by the way. Right. <laughs> it compounded at about thirteen percent, uh, which was maybe fifty basis points ahead of the S and P over the same period. So you say, oh well, that's not that great, fifty basis points over the S and P. But remember, we had bond positions, you know, and we had about. 50 or 60 percent of the volatility of the S and P, so there was a lot of alpha there. So, um, wow, so much there. You you mentioned earlier that you had give or take 150 managers, uh, sort of across the globe. Yeah. What was the process? What was the due diligence process like in in choosing your managers and um, was there an overarching uh, theme to diversification? Right. Well, first of all, the uh, when I say 150 managers, uh, the very largest portion of that was in the non-traditional area. You know, if you look at sort of traditional stock and bond managers, 
you know, there weren't that many. And we also indexed a pretty good chunk of the domestic equity exposure. So most of the managers were really in the, in the non-traditional space, particularly private equity, which was sort of the signature portion of our portfolio. You know, I struggled with different approaches as to how to organize an office to do all of these things. And where we ended up was we had a number of individuals who specialized in an asset class. So one person did private equity, one person did hedge funds, one person did real estate and real assets and so on. So they did most of the real legwork in, uh, in finding managers and doing the initial due diligence. But then we had a process that I thought was really good, was, and that was uh, the final decision was made by the group as a whole. So, you know, the private equity person would, would source a manager, do a lot of due diligence, and then actually bring them in to present to our entire team. And and I did that because I thought there was a lot of cross-fertilization there. You know, the private equity person might have some insights that would help the real estate uh, person and so on. And so that was our process. Uh, we were probably understaffed for the number of managers we have. You know, the Vanderbilt staff currently is more than twice as big as it was when I left. Uh, so it's probably true that we didn't have as many people uh, doing the work as we should have. But that was my call because I actually don't like managing people. <laughs> and so I wanted to be an investor and I wanted to work with a close knit team and not have to spend a lot of time doing other stuff. Do you remember your best performing fund? Uh, yeah, I actually do. We were, we were in a, a Sequoia venture capital fund uh, that uh, invested in the creation of Google. And that was a triple digit IRR fund. Is that Mike Moritz? Yeah. And you know, I actually was good friends with Mike Moritz. And some years later, he's a very prominent alumnus of Oxford University in England. And uh, he was nice enough to say to Ox Oxford was asking him to make a major gift. And he was nice enough to say, you know, you need more horsepower on your investment committee at Oxford. So I want you to put Bill Spitz on there. So I was actually on the investment committee at Oxford for a few years, which was pretty interesting. And then, of course, Wall Street Journal yesterday, Sequoia named a new managing partner, Doug, you know, so yeah. uh, that that's very interesting. So you know, I'll, I'll give you the numbers because it's incredible. Uh, we were an investor with both uh, Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins. So we had two bites at the uh, creation of Google. Our, our LP contribution to that investment was $500,000. And after the 30 percent carry that both of them get, we took out one hundred million dollars. <laughs> That's incredible. So if you were in KP at the time, you must have been in Amazon too. Yes, we were. I mean, we were in Amazon, we were in Cisco, we were in Google, we were in uh, Juniper Networks, uh, we were in Apple. I mean, you know, we were in tons of things. And uh, as I said earlier, that was a signature component of our portfolio. And you know, the private equity portfolio really made my career. It made the results that we achieved. That's amazing. So um, you also write a lot, and, and for people who want to read what you write, they can go to Diversified Trust and, and that website um, and click on some articles. But uh, one of the things that you have written about, and, and since Alto uh, helps people invest their retirement savings, uh, one of the things that, that you have written about is longevity. Yeah. And, you know, I'd, I'd just like to leave this open ended and, and ask you how you think um, longevity is affecting the way we think about our investments. Well, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating topic and there are many different components of it. One is what's ha happening to life expectancy in, in the U.S. and the rest of the world. That's one piece. Another piece is the, inv and the investment part of it. And, you know, the advice I give people is very simple, you know, start or start saving early and retire late uh, because, you know, time is the is the biggest asset you have in investing over time. Uh, so, you know, that it seems like simple advice, but I think it's a great advice. And, you know, as someone who's flunked retirement, uh, you know, I retired so-called in, uh, in when I was 56. Uh, I spent about six months fooling around and then I went back to work. And uh, so I believe that, uh, you know, being fully engaged at something is really important for your mental health and your longevity. Well, one of, one of the pieces that's, I, I think, implicit or embedded in the statement, like start saving early and retirement late, is the idea of compounding, yep. uh, especially for tax advantage accounts. And, and I'm, ju I'm, I'm just curious because uh, 
I, I used to say that Einstein referred to compound interest as uh, the the uh, eighth wonder of the world. And right. I'm just curious if, if you think he actually gets credit for that or if he was borrowing it from somebody else. Well, I think he gets credit for it, but it's not clear that he actually said it. But, yeah. it, but it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I use it all the time myself. Yeah. I, I, I recently I, I, made a, a Zoom presentation to a group of high school students who were interested in finance. And I gave them four or five simple pieces of advice. And the first one was, you know, start early and stay late, you know, keep keep at it. Uh, but another one I said, you know, the, the, all it takes to be successful in investing is just to continuously compound away and not that, make huge mistakes. That, 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 that's right. And so, um, you know, another piece that I think is really interesting and, and quite topical is the heart and soul of corporate America and ESG investing. And for those who don't know, ESG is environmental, social, and governance. Um, and clearly, we have some very large asset management firms, BlackRock, Blackstone, making uh, significant statements with respect to how ESG is going to affect their deployment of capital. Hoping you could spend a couple minutes talking about this yourself. Sure. Well, it's a subject I think is really interesting. And maybe for your uh, viewers who don't know the background, uh, Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist at the University of Con uh, Chicago, wrote an article, uh, I think in the early 70s, where he said, really, the only goal of a corporation is to make profits. He said, everything else is secondary. And that really guided corporate America and corporate thinking for a long, long time. So it was all about profits. It was all about earnings. And, uh, and you know, that led to a lot of the things we, we know about today, you know, shareholder activism and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. But in the last few years, there's been this shift in the whole uh, se corporate sensibility where, you know, people are beginning to say, wait a minute, we have lots of constituencies, not just shareholders. Uh, you know, we have uh, employees, we have communities, we have customers and so on. So I think there's there, we're in the middle of a, a titanic shift from the, you know, the Friedman mentality to a different mentality where it's all about multiple constituencies. And in my own view is that in some number of years, I don't know what it'll be, four or five years, perhaps something like that. You know, we won't even talk about ESG. It'll be so embedded in everything we do that we won't have to think about it. And I hope that's where we get. And I, you know, it's interesting that you bring up the Friedman point because there's a, there's an argument that Friedman uh, and and everything is about profitability in certain respects, um, and obviously we can't draw a direct cause and effect, but was related to uh, Boeing as we know it today and the decision making. Um, which ultimately led to, you know, many, many years later, uh, the 737 MAX, is it the 737 MAX? Yeah, the 737 yeah, MAX, yeah. Yeah. MAX yeah. issues. Um, and, you know, like you, I hope we, we are making that shift and that ESG will no longer be a thing. It'll just be. You know, one of the uh, impacts of the Friedman view, I think, that we're still very much feeling, and it's very controversial, is the whole issue of share buybacks and whether that's something that's really beneficial to the overall economy. You know, it certainly uh, has benefited stockholders in recent years, but, you know, whether the right use of corporate resources is to buy back stock as opposed to doing R&D and building new equipment and so on, that's a very interesting, hotly debated topic. Well, Howard Schultz doesn't think it's a very good idea. Right. Right. You know, uh, buybacks were only uh, made legal after 1982. Prior to that, it was illegal. And most people don't know that. So it's a relatively new phenomenon. Yeah. Um, one more piece that you've written that is also topical and, and at least I, I think most people hope we'll be able to put it behind us at some point here, which is the effect of COVID on the markets and in the marketplace and Clearly, we have other contributors to inflation today than, than just COVID, but thought I'd ask for your thoughts there as well. You know, any particular piece of the whole puzzle that you want to focus on? Um, well, I, I think what's happening with respect to supply chain and effects on inflation is uh, where I'd like to focus because people today are trying to decide, you know, what investments to make. 
And uh, clearly, as rates rise, which we haven't seen in decades, right? Uh, what's what's the effect of that on investment decision making? Well, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that the market usually gets it right. So I'm not uh, one who often says that I think the market's got it wrong. But this may be one of those times, because if you look at the uh, inflation rate that's priced into the bond market at the moment, you know, the 10 year break even inflation rates, uh, you know, th three and some change, maybe a little bit below. And, I, and I, my own view is that inflation is going to be a lot higher for a lot longer. And, you know, I think some of that is, is COVID related. A big chunk of it is Russia, Ukraine related. And, you know, I don't know that most people get yet just what impact uh, the war in Ukraine is, is, is and will have on the world. You know, but Ukraine and Russia together are huge uh, suppliers of food to the world. They're big suppliers of energy to the world. They're big suppliers of a lot of precious metals. And one little one I just wrote a, a little blog about was uh, Ukraine uh, produces about 50 percent of the neon in the world. And neon is used in the lasers that make semiconductor chips. So, uh, you know, we all already had a shortage of chips that was impacting the supply of cars and appliances and so on. That may well get worse. Uh, so, you know, there are all these uh, sort of uh, tentacles that reach out from this whole conflict that I think are just going to exacerbate some of what's been going on with COVID. So, you know, I, I think we're going to continue to have supply chain issues and I think we're going to have shortages. And you know, I saw something the other day, I don't remember who it was, but someone quoted that uh, the, the current younger generation has never seen a shortage of anything. And this will be <laughs> a, a major shock to them. I know that was an interesting point of view. They, they, they also, so two points there. One, they haven't seen a shortage of anything. And two, they haven't seen, so I'm with you, by the way. I don't think we have it right yet with respect to where rates are going and how long they're going to be there. But I'm just old enough to remember what it was like in the 80s. And, and and where mortgage rates went and what borrowing rates were like. And, you know, God forbid we see that. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want us to see that, but I, I don't think we have it right yet either. Um, and, I, and I think what's interesting from a, a product perspective, sort of the equivalent of the inverted yield curve. Um, and for, for those who, who haven't yet read about the inverted yield curve, although every major paper is writing about it, um, it, you know that the the two year rate has been um, ha has been higher than the the ten year rate. I think the product equivalent is used cars selling for more than new cars because right. you can't you can't even get a new car right. right. Like the, the the supply chains and a lot of that is the the chip industry. Um, so uh, you know. Be, before we set up this uh, set up the podcast, you you sent me a quick note to say something that to 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 make me aware of something that um, you think is really important from an investment standpoint, and that is the major factor for investment success is to uh, minimize the damage caused by investment noise, right? Which is which is a great sort of macro level, high level uh, direction or topic. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> well, you know, all investors, including in, in professional investors, are human beings. And we're all subject to all the influences that, that hit us every day from every direction. And, you know, after thinking about it for many, many years, it occurred to me that all of this stuff is really, really damaging. Uh, to you because it spurs those natural human emotions of fear and greed, and it spurs you to do things. And, you know, one of my favorite uh, ideas over time was Warren Buffett saying that, you know, each investor should have a, a ticket with 20 punches in it. And each time you make an investment decision, you, you punch one, and that's all you get in your lifetime. So I'm a real believer in, in not doing a lot in investment portfolios, but all of this noise stimulates to do stuff. And most things that you do are destructive. You know, there's been a ton of studies that show that when institutional investors fire a manager and hire a new one, the new one underperforms the one that they hire. And the same is true of individual investments. And people forget about transaction costs and taxes and all that other stuff. So, you know, I think once you set up a portfolio carefully, the key is basically with a little bit of tinkering here and there 
to keep it in place over time. And that's, I think that's how you compound, as we talked about before. But, but the, the main thing that, that, that damages this whole approach is this idea of noise. So what, what is noise? So noise is pundits. Noise is economists' forecasts. Noise is Wall Street analysts' predictions. Noise is, uh, you know, financial talk show hosts ranting and raving. You know, noise is um, the advertisements of uh, financial services companies. Noise is headlines in the financial media. Noise is political pundits and all the stuff that goes with it. So, you know, the list goes on and on. But uh, all of those so, things. So what do you do? How do you put your headphones on and block out the noise? And when the noise is out, what what should someone do? Like, are there three key things that a listener can do when uh, thinking about their next investment? Well, I think the first one, as we talked about before, is, uh, you know, determine your investment objectives carefully. Save as much as you can. Once you figure out sort of what your risk tolerance is and what your goals are, you know, construct a portfolio that's likely to achieve that over time and then leave it alone. Let it work. And, you know, there are a lot of great tools around that to help people do this. You know, if you go onto the websites of any of the big mutual fund companies, you know, they have great planning tools. They have great asset allocation tools. They have great tools to help, you know, an individual figure out how much to save for retirement or a college education or all that. So, you know, all those tools exist. So use them, you know, set up an intelligent portfolio and then let it work over time. And that's, that's sort of the key to me. And it's impossible to tune out all the noise. And, you know, and a little bit of noise is fun, you know, for people who want to trade. You know, I think that's great for people who want to take a portion of their money and, and play with it. But the core should be set up in a long term, you know, specific, you know, structured sort of way and, and let compound interest work. So that's one of the things that I really like about illiquid alternative assets, by the way, which is that you can't wake up and panic sell. Right. Nor can you wake up and panic buy, by the way. Right, right, right. <laughs> you really, but, it, but I think where, where most of us humans really hurt ourselves is, is waking up, hearing the noise, inflation this, rates that, you know, and, and like, oh, my God, I get, and something in the news, I got to sell. Right. Um, and when you're invested in illiquid assets, you, can, you can't do that. Right. Um, I, I don't know if, if you have any thoughts on that subject. Well, I agree with that totally. And another thing I would say is, uh, and I'll quote my friend Dave Swinson, Dave said the ultimate form of capitalism, capitalism is private equity. And I mentioned before that I've been very successful as a private equity investor. And I love private equity, not only because it's illiquid, but because you don't have to worry about quarterly earnings. You don't have to worry about Wall Street. You can do the right thing. You can manage a company you know, for long-term growth and, and really make the investments you need to make. So, you know, I agree with that. And the same thing is true of, of say, real estate. Uh, you know, you think about buying a stock, what can you do? You buy it, you sell it. That, that, that's all the tools you have. You know, if you buy a piece of real estate, you know, you can retenant it, you can build out parcels, you can renovate it. There's a ton of things you can do. So, you know, in, these, in many of these private asset classes, a skilled manager can really add a lot of value. Whereas we all know that stock and bond managers are beating their heads against the wall trying to <laughs> outperform an index, which they don't do. Right. So uh, let's talk about an alternative that's that's actually liquid and is currently referred to as an alternative. And I don't know how much longer we're going to do that, which is, of course, crypto. Crypto, and, right. And um, do you currently, yeah, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this, do you currently have exposure to, to crypto assets? And if so, which ones? And what what do you think may happen with respect to uh, uh, government-denominated uh, stable coins? Well, I'm certainly not an expert, so take what I say with a grain of salt. But my view is that uh, blockchain technology is really important and it's going to totally change the way we do virtually everything. So I'm a big bull on, uh, blo on, on blockchain. With respect to cryptos, you know, Bitcoin was, was invented not as an investment medium, but as a, me a means of doing transactions and, you know, exchanging money between parties without the, uh, the uh, influence of big institutions seamlessly, quickly, et cetera. 
I don't think we're quite there, but I think we'll get there over time. You know, they'll at the moment, Bitcoin is awfully volatile to be a medium of exchange. It's slow, it's expensive, all those things. But other cryptos will, will solve those issues. So I'm bullish on the idea of uh, crypto as, as a medium of exchange over time. In terms of its investment merits, I'm still a little bit of a skeptic because, you know, unfortunately, I, I'm old enough that I was trained in a way that, uh, you know, you need in order to invest, you need to be able to figure out what something is worth and buy something at a discount to its intrinsic value. And I don't know how you figure out the intrinsic value of Bitcoin or any of the other cryptos. And the same is true of gold, by the way, which people have been investing in. So, you know, I find myself hard pressed to invest in something when I can't analyze it in, in a way that's comfortable to me. And so I end up thinking, well, you know, it's, it's basically a trading medium. It's a sort of a speculative vehicle. And that's fine. It's great for people to do that. But I personally have a hard time bringing myself to do that. And that's, that's probably my own weakness as opposed to a commentary on the medium. Or, or you could call it a safety measure. <laughs> right. But again, you know, I, I used to, uh, when I was giving advice to individuals, I used to uh, use what I call the 80-20 rule, which is, you know, invest 80% of your portfolio in a diversified sort of basic portfolio and then play with the other 20%. And if you want to trade, you want to do Bitcoin, you want to do, you know, NFTs, whatever it is, great, go for it. I, I, I like that. Uh, I like that advice. So specifically with respect to alternative assets and, and diversified portfolios, it's one thing to be an institutional asset manager and have access to the Sequoias and KPs of the world. It's another thing to be a, a retail investor. Right. What, what role, if any, do you think uh, alternatives can and should play in uh, a Main Street retail investor's portfolio? And um, how can they best participate if you think they should? Well, I think it's very reasonable for them to do a portion of their their portfolio in uh, in alternative assets. And it's becoming easier and easier to do that over time. Uh, you know, you now have, well, for one thing, in the private equity space, a number of the big uh, private equity firms are public companies, so you can buy their stock, which is an indirect way to play in the private equity space. You know, in the in the real estate space, there are REITs, uh, which are available to small investors. So that's an alternative. Uh, you know, there are also a number of ETFs now that are sort of focused on more niche strategies. You know, they're, they're ETFs focused on infrastructure investing. They're ETFs focused on farmland. Uh, they're in ETFs focused on timberland and so on. So, you know, there, there are now a lot of retail products uh, that individuals uh, can access. So, you know, I think for a portion of the portfolio, that's terrific. So um, I'm not sure that a lot of people know what an organization, a company like Diversified Trust does. Can, can you tell us a little bit? Sure. So we work with both institutions and individuals and families. Uh, the institutional part of our business is a smaller part. So the, the majority of our business is working with uh, uh, well-to-do families. Typically, they're fairly complex families uh, with uh, estate planning needs, uh, with charitable interests, uh, complicated assets. So many of our uh, clients have family businesses or pieces of real estate or so on. And what we do for them basically is anything that we can to support them in their financial needs. So we have on our staff, CPAs, attorneys, uh, financial planners, uh, and the investment piece as well. So we try to be one-stop shopping for wealthy families. And we end up doing a lot of things other than just sort of traditional investing and financial planning. We end up educating younger generations about investing. We end up uh, acting as the referee in family battles sometimes. Those aren't so fun. No, those aren't fun. But, you know, it's part of the deal. Uh, you know, and one of the things I've learned in, in working with these families is, you know, psychology is a really important thing in understanding how different people think and different generations think and their needs and objectives is, is every bit as important as all the technical stuff I learned at the University of Chicago. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting in terms of educating younger generations. And I think uh, some of the the exposure that those individuals are, are receiving today 
Um, some might describe them as real assets. Others may may describe them as cultural assets. Mm -hmm. Things like uh, investing in in wine or artwork or antique automobiles. I'm curious to understand if you have so. There is intrinsic value in some of those things. Yes, yeah. uh, but if you drink the bottle of the wine, right. uh, that there there it goes. I'm I'm wondering if you have some thoughts here. I'd say a couple of things. One, I, I go back to what I just said before. You know, I think you should have a core portfolio of, of largely liquid, per, perhaps some illiquid assets, and then you can do these things around it. So I think that's great. You know, I wouldn't invest in those kinds of things as the sole component of my portfolio, but you know, doing these other things is, is is fun and interesting and potentially very lucrative. So, you know, I think it's great. The one thing you've got to ask yourself, though, whenever you're investing in anything is what do I know versus the rest of the world? And either you have to know a lot or you have to have access to people that know a lot, because otherwise you can lose an awful lot of money very quickly. And you may buy some good wine that you enjoy, but if it's not a great <laughs> investment, you know, you have to understand what that potentially might be. Yeah, I can't invest in wine because, you know, it's sitting there and then someone comes over for dinner and, right. well, you need a bottle of wine. Right. Uh, but um, So I, I myself uh, really like uh, really high-end watches. So I own a number of, of really good collectible kinds of watches. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time understanding the prices in the market and, you know, understanding the demand and so on. And that's actually another area that's similar to one you mentioned before in that if you buy a, a, a new Patek Philippe watch today, one, it's not easy to get a hold of them. But uh, if you buy the same watch in the, in the uh, pre-owned market, it's much more expensive than the manufacturer's select, uh, you know, re uh, recommended retail price because there's a shortage of them. So, uh, you know, there's another market where I happen to play myself a little bit. And I'll never sell any of them. They're like my children, so they're not really investments, but I enjoy knowing about them. Yeah, no, that's a, and and we've seen a number of different platforms, uh, investment platforms pop up over the last several years, um, several of which uh, I'll just plug away also partners with, where individuals can go, whether it's uh, Rally or Otis um, or the like, where, where individuals can go and invest in things like uh, collectible watches without having to pony up for the whole thing. They get an ownership interest. This idea of fractionalization right. that that just wasn't available to people five years ago. And so I, I, I think it's really interesting to see where we're headed and uh, how that market develops. You know, the one part of fractionalization I'm not so sure how I feel about is uh, the slices that a lot of the firms offer now, you know, the brokerage firms where you can put in five bucks and get a fractional share of something. And, you know, it's a good news, bad news situation. I think it's great that it's gotten a, a lot of younger investors into investing. You know, on the other hand, I could argue as an old guy that uh, there are a lot of signs of sort of speculative excess out there right now, which that is one. So, I, I'm not sure what to make of all that, but it's bubbling around in my head all the time. Well, well I think similarly, the most recent news about Tesla's stock split, right? Like, theoretically, nothing changed. Right, right. <laughs> the, and 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 yet the they they announced the split, and I I don't I don't even remember what the uh, price inflation was that day, but um, it, it went up big. considerably. Yeah, it, it it was big, and yet nothing changed from a from a business standpoint. Um, but you know, if you if you look at uh, what's going on in the last year or two, you know, massive increase in the number of retail brokerage accounts. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Robinhood and Reddit and, you know, GameStop and all of that. Uh, you know, if you look at the volume in small contract option trades, it's gone through the roof. Uh, you know, if you look at the percentage of overall trading that's now attributable to retail versus institutions, you know, and the list goes on and on. There are lots of things that older guys would say, wow, this is a this is the classic signs of a bubble. So I don't know, but it's interesting to look at. I, I, I hear you. What haven't I asked you yet this morning? Uh, what haven't you asked me? Um, uh, well, I guess one of the things you didn't really ask me is what is what do I do with my own portfolio? Yes, what do you do with your own portfolio? I uh, I, I barbell it basically, uh, and what that means is I keep a, a fairly big chunk in 
in cash and short-term bonds. And then the other stuff, I do private equity and the ownership of my firm and that sort of stuff. I don't do much conventional stock and bond investing. And, you know, that's been to my detriment over the last 10 or 15 years when stocks and bonds have done great. Uh, but I'm, you know, a big chunk of, of, of how you approach investing should be your own personal risk tolerance. And, you know, at my age, I'm more concerned about keeping what I have than making a lot of money. So I sleep very well having a lot of money and in, in investments that don't yield very much return, but are pretty safe. I wouldn't recommend that for other people, but it works for me. Well, there you have it. Bill, thank you so much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it. I was looking forward to this for quite some time, and I, I'm just thrilled and both honored to, to have you. Well, it was my pleasure, and uh, you asked a lot of great questions, and uh, I'm going to have to go home and scratch in my head and think if uh, I could have done a better job of answering some of them, but it was really fun. Oh, thank you again for being here. The Altogether Show is brought to you by Alto. Alto knows that achieving true portfolio diversification means investing in more than just stocks and bonds. That's why Alto developed a streamlined platform to make it easy and cost-effective to invest tax-advantaged retirement savings in alternatives, assets like real estate, venture capital, and crypto that are outside of the public markets and available through Alto's growing list of investment partners. To learn more, visit altoira.com altogether.